a vital part of our lives. Sleep is also a health-related behavior, much like eating, drinking, and exercising. And like all health-related behaviors, they all have many things in common, but most especially is moderation. Now, if you under or overindulge, you can face serious consequences to your health. For example, if you underindulge and don't consume enough calories, you, become, you can become malnourished or even die. If you overindulge, you can become obese and face serious health consequences like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and even certain kinds of cancer. Now, of course, indulging every now and then is not only perfectly acceptable, but it's also beneficial to boost our mood and overall sense of well-being. Now, I'm sure everyone in here can concur that not getting enough sleep is not good for our mood and our cognition. If you're sleep deprived, you might feel cranky and lose the ability to focus. But what about sleeping too much? Is this even possible? If we conclude that it's either physically impossible to sleep too much or that it isn't harmful to our health to sleep too much, then that would mean that sleep is the only health-related behavior that is the exception to this rule of moderation. Now, what are some of the clues that tell us that sleeping too much is harmful? Well, there have been numerous large-scale epidemiological studies that have demonstrated a U-shaped curve. And what happens here is these studies have shown that there's an increased risk of morbidities like cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, and an increased risk of mortality in those populations of people who sleep less than seven hours per night, but also who sleep more than seven hours per night. It could mean that sleeping too much is causing these health conditions, right? With this particular U-shaped curve, we're seeing that the results are suggesting that not sleeping enough is on par with sleeping too much. So even though they might suggest that, these health that sleeping too much is causing these health conditions, it could also suggest that sleeping too much is indicative of an underlying health condition. But we don't know the direction of causality until we do more experimental studies. Now, <clears throat> when we consider sleeping too much, if we conclude that sleeping too much is not physically possible, then again, this would be the exception to the norm. We have mechanisms in our brain that stop us from overdoing certain behaviors, but it doesn't necessarily mean that these behaviors still can't be considered excessive. For example, let's consider eating. There are mechanisms in our brain that stop us from overeating. There are hormones and signals that tell us that we are full. But we can ignore those signals. I can eat a really large meal, feel completely stuffed, but I'm still going to go for the chocolate cake for dessert. Sleep may work in the same fashion. So even though we have these signals and mechanisms that make it more difficult for us to fall asleep, or at least tell us that we're rested, we can still override these signals and get more sleep than what's adequate for us. There are a few caveats to consider here. there are situations in which we really should get more sleep than the typical amount. For example, we don't really know why it is that we sleep, but we do know it's important for certain functions, like immunological function. So if you're sick or if you're injured, you really should get more sleep to improve the healing process. Another caveat to consider here is that there are individual differences when it comes to how much sleep your body actually needs. Even though the recommended number of hours of sleep for adults is about seven to eight hours per night, 
there are individual differences that vary from person to person in terms of how much sleep you actually need. So how do we find out what's adequate for, for you? Well, the key is to keep a consistent sleep-wake cycle and then assess how rested you feel each morning. Now, sleep extension is becoming a more commonly used technique to improve metabolic function in chronically sleep-deprived populations. If you know that you're sleep deprived, if you know that you're not making the time to sleep or you're not feeling rested, then sleep extension therapy might be right for you. But there's this constant message from the medical community to just get as much sleep as you can. But it doesn't take into consideration how much sleep we're actually getting. So even though we have this message of just sleep as much as you can no matter what, we have to consider that it might be dangerous to say this to, to the public. So consider the following comparison. Let's say you're in a room full of people who are starved. You would encourage those individuals, get as much food, get as many calories as you can whenever and wherever you can. However, not all calories are created equal, and quality is important here. So you would encourage those individuals to get, consume high quality foods. If you're in a room full of people who are chronically sleep deprived, again, your message would be, get as much sleep as you can, whenever and wherever you can. If you're in a room full, of, but again, quality is important here, right? You would need to get good quality sleep. If you're in a room full of people who are of healthy, adequate weight, you wouldn't tell those individuals, eat more just for the sake of eating more, just as if you're in a room full of people who sleep an adequate amount. You wouldn't tell those individuals to sleep more just for the sake of sleeping more. Now, there are some caveats, again, that we should consider here in terms of sleeping too much. If you spend a lot of time in bed, and if you're relatively healthy and you still feel sleepy, you could be sleeping too much. But I'm not talking sleeping in every now and then. I'm talking about chronic, almost nightly excessive sleep that's past what's adequate for your body. Now, in order to understand how sleeping too much might be harmful, let's first cover the basics of sleep. So <clears throat> when you sleep during the night, your sleep is broken into 90-minute cycles. And each cycle is made up of different types and stages of sleep. Now, these types and stages of sleep include deep sleep, light sleep, and REM, or rapid eye movement sleep. Now, REM sleep is that type of sleep that's associated with dreaming. The amount of time that you spend in each stage and type of sleep varies across each cycle, but each cycle is still 90 minutes long. The amount of time that you spend in each cycle and the overall amount of sleep that you get makes up what we refer to as your sleep architecture. Now let's consider the following example. Let's say you go to bed at 11 p.m. and you wake up at 6.30 a.m. In this example, you're getting about seven and a half hours of sleep and you're going through about five full cycles. At the beginning of the night, you're gonna spend more of that sleep in that first cycle in deep sleep. You're gonna spend less of that in REM. And then as you progress through the night, through each cycle, you're gonna spend less and less time in deep sleep and more and more time in REM sleep until you've gone through all of your cycles. Now, if you were to wake up while you were in deep sleep, you would wake up feeling super groggy, super confused, and whoever woke you up might not be safe, okay? Now, if you were to wake up while you're in 
REM sleep, then you'll feel much more rested, ready to tackle the day, and you'll feel pretty good. I know that probably everybody here has had a situation where you woke up an hour before your alarm clock and you felt great. You felt fantastic. And you said to yourself, wow, I feel really good. I should get up and tackle the day. And then you go, but I have another hour where I can sleep. So what do you do? You get up and tackle the day, right? No, just kidding. You go right back to sleep, you roll over, and then your alarm clock wakes you up, and then you feel like trash. You feel awful. You go, this is just terrible. I should have just gotten up. You want to smash that alarm clock? You hate life? I get it. You really should have gotten up, is what you should have done. So you were oversleeping when your alarm clock woke you up. Now let's consider here that during the course of the night, you're sleeping and you're awoken. You experience a disruption. What is going to happen is you're going to get pulled out of the current stage or cycle or type of sleep that you're currently in. And it's likely going to disrupt your cycle and maybe subsequent cycles for that night. Now one disruption may not cause too much of an issue. But if you experience multiple disruptions during the night, now we're getting to really poor sleep quality and your sleep, sleep architecture is disrupted. So what's gonna happen is, is you're going to feel sleepy in the morning and you're gonna try to get more sleep that night. If you're able to get sleep the following night and recover, then your sleep deprivation cycle is broken and you're good to go. But if you continue to experience disruptions, then what's going to happen is, is you're going to feel sleepy in the morning. You're going to try to make up for that sleep by getting more sleep. That becomes fragmented. Your sleep architecture is not balanced. Your sleep quality is poor. It's going to make you feel sleepy again in the morning. And then again, you're gonna to try to get more sleep and so on and so forth until you experience chronic sleep deprivation. Now what's gonna happen here is you're not going to deprive yourself of total sleep time. You're actually depriving yourself of the right amount of types of sleep per cycle. Now, a way to end this cycle is to cut it off, to stop spending more time in bed, and to try to remove as many disruptions as you can. And if you have kids, it's not gonna happen, right? <laughs> so, the way to answer the question, if sleeping too much is harmful, is to do experimental studies. The original studies done in the late 1960s and early 1970s actually coined the term the Rip Van Winkle effect to show the kinds of symptoms that's experienced when you oversleep. The grogginess, the tiredness, the achiness that you feel when you sleep too much, that's attributed to the excessive sleep. We've also found with sleep extension studies that as people's sleep increases as they spend more time sleeping, it turns out that the fragmentation increases. It's more disruptive. And then what happens is, is that this is actually giving us evidence that it's the sleep disruption that's the culprit. There have been studies done on something referred to as sleep restriction. For people who are consistently excessive sleepers, they may actually benefit from having their sleep reduced. And there have been some really promising results with having people sleep restricted when they have, for example, insomnia, and has improved the symptoms of depression and anxiety. With all of this evidence surrounding the potential harmful effects of sleeping too much, we really need more experimental studies on people who sleep adequately extend their sleep for a period of time, and then see what effects that has on their health. 
With all of this potential evidence surrounding the potential harmful effects, the message that we should just be getting as much sleep as possible might not be the right message. Instead, what we really should be saying is sleep in moderation to maximize the benefits to your health. So my message to you is to go home, get some sleep, but just not too much. <laughs>